Good afternoon. You know, uh, I'm S.P. Kothari. Uh, I'm the deputy dean here. And I'm honored to introduce uh, the first presentation of this year's uh, Dean's Innovative Lecture Series. For those of you who are new to MIT Sloan, this series is one of the most popular events because it offers all of us the opportunity to hear firsthand the experiences and lessons learned from influ influential and innovative leaders in both the public and private sector. It's just one of the many ways in which we foster collaboration between the business sector and the academic community. Today we welcome Tom Gloser, who is CEO of Thomson Reuters. We are very fortunate to have Tom here with us today to share the thoughts on leadership, particularly at this important time in the evolution of Thomson Reuters. Before I introduce Tom to you, let me just remind everyone of a few logistics. First, please remember to silence your cell phones for the duration of today's presentation. Also, when we get to the Q&A, and Tom has promised that there would be plenty of time for Q&A, when we get to that portion of the program, please remember to wait for the microphone to be passed to you, not only so that everyone can hear what you have to say, but also so that it is picked up on the videotape of today's presentation. In other words, be careful what you say. You know, so. <laughs> <clears throat> By way of introduction, Tom Gloser started with Reuters back in 1993 and then in 2001, he became the first non-journalist and first American to be named president of Reuters. Tom has overseen the strategic direction of Tom Thomson Reuters since the 2008 merger with Thomson Corporation. At that time, he became the CEO of a multi-billion dollar global news organization and the world's leading source of information for businesses and professionals in the financial, legal, tax, accounting, scientific, and healthcare markets. Thomson Reuters brings information to businesses using innovative tools and real-time real solutions to report unbiased news to over one billion people every day. These tools and solutions supply legal compliant information to prepare the rule of law, provide transparency to the changing tax environment, and increase the efficiency of healthcare delivery. Thomson Reuters' mission is to fuel the engine of science to solve problems and provide answers that help the people turn some of the world's toughest challenges and unprecedented achievements. These are lofty goals indeed, but Thomson Reuters, with its focus on innovative solutions and with Tom leading the charge, is poised to deliver its mission and more. Please welcome to the, por uh, to the podium a truly innovative leader, Tom Gloser. Thank you, Dean. Um, when I heard I was the uh, first speaker in the Dean series this year, I thought, OK, this is all right. I get it. I'm the alpha drop of the new code. And so the key thing is just get the thing delivered and start iterating a bit. And so what I'd like to do is I'll talk for a while, because I think it's only fair I've been invited. I'll talk about a couple of things that are interesting to me. Uh, one of them is actually not leadership. Um, it's very, my former colleagues here will recognize that coming and not speaking about what I'm invited to speak about is very much sort of um, up my alley. Uh, in part because I think leadership is not something uh, that you teach as an end result. It's something that actually comes out of partly who you are and partly 
how you model the behavior as opposed to go around endlessly and telling everybody what an unbelievable leader you are and how I'm going to impart these three golden rules that you too follow and you'll be guaranteed to be a leader. So I'm going to do something much more dangerous, I think. I'm going to talk about um, technology and technology strategy um, in a arena where uh, my audience knows far more about technology than I do and probably have a lot more practical experience as well. Um, but it's something that's real important to our company and something that intellectually has always been really interesting to me. Um, and I'd submit pretty much right across the board, whatever industries you ultimately choose to go into, including academia, uh, the understanding what technology can and can't do for you on an abstract level, on a strategic level, on a business level, is often a lot more important than understanding you know, what it can do in the next particular point release. So to do this, the only way I can think about doing it is to tell you a couple of stories. And they're not going to sound like technology stories for a while. So I'll tell you stories out of a couple of stories out of the history of Thomson Reuters. Uh, the dean described quite well what we do. I boil it down really to two things, which are fast becoming one. Uh, wherever professionals need software and content to do their jobs, we want to be there with a compelling proposition that we deliver almost entirely electronically right into their workflow. And it's true whether you trade currency options. It's true whether you're a lawyer working to prepare a case. It's true whether you're a bench scientist or a manager of IP or a tax professional. That's the core of our business. And I say that it's sort of two things converging into one because although in generation 1.0 you could pretty clearly identify what's information, you know, what's a static set of content that lives within a database to be extracted, and what is software that acts as operator on these operands, um, increasingly the two are blurred so that, you know, I no longer can really tell the difference what is software as service and platform as service as it's being delivered to you, which is a stream in real time of zeros and ones, and now what is content that comes with rich metadata that lives in a, in a data model that has symbology, um, which essentially takes it from being 2D to more 3D actionable data. And, and that's essentially what we do. Um, but let me go back and tell you stories when it was a little bit less sort of electronic. So there's a famous story, famous at least internally at Thomson Reuters, about um, old Baron Reuters, uh, uh, Ju uh, Julius Reuters, who uh, originally uh, saw that the need was to move information as fast as possible in the mid-19th century. And largely, this was being done already by telegraph. But there were gaps in the telegraph system, even in continental Europe. And a particular gap that existed was between the city of Brussels and Aachen in Germany, where the good baron lived. And he figured out that uh, by training carrier pigeons to actually carry little scrolls of the news where there was this gap in the telegraph wires, he could beat the next best way of doing it, which was to go on horseback. And obviously enough, the pigeons can fly over the trees and across the forest, and the horses had to follow the post routes. And thereby, he beat the competitors and delivered the news more quickly. Um, in a sort of modern codicil to the story, I often say that he also invented redundant packet transmission because he sent two pigeons with two scrolls and hoped one of them actually made it to its destination. So it wasn't exactly guaranteed delivery, but at least he increased the odds. And, and I'd argue that um, if you looked at the context of the times, the pigeon was technology. It was a better technology than horses in 1860 continental Europe. A little bit later in that same decade, 
another example of how a rowboat can be better technology. So at the time, news traveled from the US to Europe via mailboat. And mailboat had to make it across X number of weeks and days to uh, dock in Southampton, and then it would, news would get up to the London market. But the ever intrepid and I'd say very innovative Baron figured out that by uh, essentially paying Irish fishermen to row off the coast of Ireland and intercept the US mailboat, which then threw down a canister of news, rowboat goes back to port and uses what was then already the telegraph wire under sea to London, he would again scoop uh, London with news coming from America. And in this case, the famous story that we tell is how Reuters scooped the London market on the death of Abraham Lincoln uh, by days, because uh, otherwise everyone else would have had to wait for the boat uh, to get to Southampton. Uh, and I tell these funny old stories because um, I think it is an example of a better use, an innovative use of technology. But we all have a tendency, I think, and it's especially true in business, to see whatever the technology we're using at a given time as the only thing that could ever be the technology. Um, we, we wear, if you will, a set of blinders that doesn't let us see that the important thing is to abstract what is the, what's the business benefit? What does the customer actually want? In this case, I want accurate information delivered to me faster than anyone else from a source that uh, I trust. And but to a large extent, that has been sort of at the core of the mission of Reuters and Thomson Reuters in many fields. Um, although how you extract business benefit uh, from that also does change over time. You know, I, I, I think it's really interesting when people are so focused on the technology of their time that they're unable to see the leap, the curve jump, as somebody I, I knew once described it, to whatever the next technology is going to be. And obviously, lots of people have written about um, in the history of science, you know, the, uh, it's that wonderful book by Tom Kuhn that I'm sure you read in, in some class uh, here on the structure of scientific revolutions and the tendency of people to, uh, even obviously esteemed scientists, to not be able to break out of the model of whether it's the Earth at the center of the solar system or any of the other uh, great belief systems until the empirical data builds up to such an important explosive event that the old model is discredited and then the new model comes up only to repeat this again whenever the new model eventually runs out of gas. And you see this all the time in business. So I'd argue we're going through this right now in journalism, in you know everywhere you pick up a newspaper who tend to be you know, very focused on what they do for a living and in their industry, and you would believe that journalism equals print or newspaper publication. And I'd submit to you that journalism is alive and well and is morphing into an electronic media, uh, and our company does, I think, uh, more than anyone else in, in that regard. Uh, but we don't think it's the death of journalism uh, because we view paper as just another output device. And it's been a good output device, right? I mean, paper is lightweight to carry, has quite a good you know, signal to noise ratio, a, a very clear, distinct, it's easy to read, black on white. Um, it passes the test of the T's somebody once described to me, which is, you can take it on the train, you can take it to the toilet without looking really weird. Um, but the economics of newspapers are beginning to break apart. And they're breaking apart for the profound reason that uh, first classified found a better medium, because it's obviously a lot easier to do search, whether it's Google or Craigslist or whatever, in a search box 
than it is uh, to try and find an apartment or a car by looking through pages and pages of fine print. And that was sort of the first disruption of the economic model. And the second is really in, in display advertising, because if people like me have always believed that you know, when we advertise as corporations, the joke is, um, I know I'm wasting half of my advertising. I just don't know which half. Well, the joke's now on the sort of print advertising world, because now actually you do know which half. And you can get very rich data back and pinpoint your ads and have ads that follow you as you, you roam around the web. And so the economics, the underlying economics of newspaper, which has been a, a staggeringly good thing to have, um, are breaking up. And here in a, in a story um, that's not even that old, but comes from the Thomson side of Thomson Reuters, uh, and just to prove to you that you know, some people can see things coming, and it was long before I was at the company, um, the Thomson family and the management of Thomson Corp at the time got out of newspapers when they were the largest newspaper owner and got out early when the party was still going very strongly and began this move into electronics. And I'd argue, although it's, it's not a case that's been written and it tends not to be talked about a lot, um, there's a huge amount of whining in the newspaper industry, in the, in the recorded music uh, industry about how the disruption of the digital age has destroyed the old model and you can't convert analog dollars into digital, uh, uh, well, into digital dollars. You get digital dimes or digital pennies. Um, the history of sort of uninterrupted value creation at Thomson um, is really one of a company that's managed very well that transition from analog to digital. Um, we still print law books. Um, and there are parts of the world where a majority of the revenue, Latin America is one, um, in the legal division is print. But there's already a glide path and people thinking about, I've got this much revenue sitting on a print platform, this much on electronic, and what are the relative advantages of the one or the other? Um, the other thing I'd mention about print, which I think, if not we, at least our kids are going to look back and say, you know, w just explain to me again, like, why this, one, made economic sense, but B, how in the world did this make environmental sense to you? So think about the environmental chain of newspapers. Um, you start with a tree in some place like Canada or Finland. Tree gets felled, gets put on a truck, diesel fuel gets used, goes to a big paper plant, at that point, a whole bunch of noxious chemicals are used to create wood paper pulp. It gets turned onto these big wheels of newsprint, put on another truck, more diesel fuel, put onto a boat, more diesel fuel, shipped across, goes to, let's say, the Globe or the New York Times plant, um, gets put up onto a big press. At that point, a single day's news gets printed on paper. Um, Papers go back on a truck, gets delivered to your house. You walk out at 6 in the morning. You grab it. You look. You stash it. Maybe later in the day, you come back and read a couple of the articles or even a half of it. And then you bin the thing, hopefully that it goes back into recycling, but just as often not. And we're going to compare this with whatever son or grandson of iPad is that I can have every morning delivered to me at essentially no distribution cost, the world's uh, editorial output, that I can recharge it, that I can by then, I hope, carry it as flexibly, read it in the sun, and then do a whole bunch of other things, because this will be the rebirth of newspapers. Um, the search box that had to be sent to your Air Mac before can come back onto a flexible plastic display for your new newspaper, right? And video, which was never something that a newspaper sort of did because it didn't have an output interface that accepted it, well, newspapers can now become interactive. It can have search, it can have video, it can have photos. 
And you see people beginning to play with that, especially in iPad applications, but we're still early in that transition. And I go into the newspaper e example a little bit more because I think it's another one of these examples of we all carry over these blinders from generation one to generation two without deeply thinking through, are they still relevant? I'll give you a couple of more examples. So first, in newspapers, right? How many of you uh, were even alive? Now, how many of you remember version 1.0 of newspaper websites, right? It was yesterday's newspaper put up into, let's say, you know, uh, the Netscape browser. And in newsrooms across the country, there was this horrible fight. You know, should we let these electronic folks scoop the next morning's print paper? And how can you do this? And you know, I want my article to appear on the paper, and I don't want to be scooped at midnight, and all sorts of insane organizational behavior, right? Um, we were talking a little bit earlier to Dean about in the banking industry, um, where we have a ton of clients, I'd go and visit folks, and they'd give me a card, and it would say, you know, I'm uh, chairman e-commerce at Morgan Stanley. I am uh, president of internet banking at fill in the blank. And I always had the same thought. I thought, God, you know, could you introduce me to the guy who's head of uh, banking using electricity? Or, or the woman who's in charge of customer relations that occasionally use plumbing. And you know, there are these brief moments of disruption where we think it's a whole separate thing, and then go on to realize, well, this is just the next large disruption, which will be pervasive and become just part of the fabric of business. A couple of other examples I, I always found funny. If you go back to the early days of television, a lot of the first um, shows and believe it or not, I wasn't alive to see these, um, were radio announcers continuing to read sort of plays and skits being filmed by cameras. Because in television, you couldn't yet conceptualize, well, what else do I do? Um, early folks using cell phones, you know, these big Motorola or Nokia bricks, you'd often see them walking down the street sort of awkwardly, like, can I make a call? Can I not? And I'd see these people standing in phone booths, the you know, pay phones, and they'd be on their cell phones because, again, you hadn't gotten used to the fact that you, know, you can all talk right through class, uh, God forbid. And you know, I see this example over and over again. And the most important thing, I think, when you're running a company or um, doing anything else which involves the application of technology to, to build advantage is really thinking through more abstractly um, what is the benefit technology is giving you? What, is it, what are the new freedoms that the form allows so you don't just carry over the last sort of set of restraints with you? And where do you want to ultimately go with it? And we think, we think a lot about these sort of issues uh, because ultimately the, the success, I think, of Thomson Reuters is founded on one of two distinct models. Our model is to attempt to be very light on our technology feet, very agile, not to be so locked in to the technology of one given era that you can't make the transition you know, mainframe to mini or mini to PC, et cetera. There's a disadvantage, because the other way of approaching technology strategy um, is to say, I want to have a chokehold on the distribution, on the hardware, um, and I'm going to leverage that to be able to extract monopoly rents off of, let's say, the software or the entertainment or the information. And you see that played out a lot. Um, some of it's behind, you know, uh, up to now, the incredibly successful Apple strategy. But you see it in Comcast um, or anybody else, big cable company, that tries to have a monopoly on, in effect, the hardware distribution, um, and then leverage it to charge you a lot for something that doesn't cost them that much to produce, which is the ultimate um, software or content that comes through the system. 
And that's a totally viable strategy. Um, you got to make enormous multi-billion dollar bets. You got to get it absolutely right. And then the tricky thing, which is, might be an interesting Sloan uh, question, is do you ever get payback for your shareholders? So can you make enough money fast enough by exploiting this monopoly position before either A, the government comes after you, and obviously they have, usually in a rear view mirror, right? They go after IBM, after IBM's already lost the market, after AT&T, when the light's out there. Um, it'll probably, you know, they've been going after Microsoft forever and forever. Uh, Microsoft seems to have managed to reinvent itself during this whole long process. Uh, but that's one, business strategy, and it's a perfectly viable one. Um, but the question is, do you get a return on your investment uh, before either A, the government takes you apart, or B, much more interestingly to me, the next disruption comes, right? So if I rely as B Sky B does, Sky Broadcasting in the UK on satellite uh, transmission, um, what do I do to defend myself if we've got you know, 4G and I can have streaming video to the home, uh, what do I do to allow full interactivity and on demand because I need a back channel and not just a one-way broadcast? And those are really interesting questions. We try and come at it from a different way. Uh, you know, it may be the sort of sneaky cockroach that survives through the generations. We try to be really light on our technology feet um, so we don't lay fiber, we don't buy transponders. Um, by and large, we rent our facilities. Uh, right now, the interesting uh, sort of set of issues we're going through is, do we need our own private proprietary cloud? Should we, uh, out, is actually raw compute uh, not that important and distribution, should we outsource it? Or should we, in effect, still do it ourselves, but take some of the virtualization and other techniques in-house and do it ourselves? And why would you do one rather the other than the other? And always with this thought of, can we be flexible? Can we be light enough on our feet uh, so that we can live to another day and we can transfer those elements that we think create value to the next generation? So I'm going to pause here. Um, I could go out and, and elaborate these in a whole bunch of different directions. But I think it would be certainly much more fun for me to stop. Um, and what I'd really love to do is hear what your thoughts are, um, including, you know, you can just say, Tom, talk a little bit about this or that. Uh, but this is becoming, you know, very broadcast in one way. And I'd much rather get into a conversation if anyone's game for it. And what I've always discovered, oh, there is, this is usually the hardest thing to do. Asking the first question is, is a uniquely difficult thing to do. Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Ian Lamont. I have a news background. And I was uh, curious about your statement about newspapers and kind of they'll, they'll have a rebirth on, the grandson, of the, I, on uh, the grandson of the iPad. And my question is this. I mean, if you, go, if you, look at, if you use an iPad right now, there's thousands of applications out there. And the newspapers have to compete with them, even if they're not news. They're just information or entertainment alternatives. And you know, where does a company like yours or any news company fit in an ecosystem like that? Yeah, I mean, that raises a really interesting set of questions, which is deeper than the output device, right? So for me, paper is one of a variety of output devices. Um, a lot of people stop at the iPad and say, oh, well, that can't be the answer because, you know, it doesn't work well on the beach or I feel awkward taking it into the john or something like that. Um, I think the interesting thing about this generation of iPad is how do you view things in a continuum, right? What is son of iPad and even more interesting, what does grandson of iPad look like? Will it be a flexible sheaf of plastic? Will it end up looking much more like a newspaper? Will it have a form factor <coughs> where, you know, one thing that always annoys me reading the New York Times or the Journal is, please continue on page A13. Please then continue A17, right? And I'm on doing this on the subway. But, you know, suddenly 
I can have a much better form factor because I can just do, I'm reading an article on the front page, I can just do this and the back of the paper is going to jump to that front page. So I'd argue we're going to get used to, once we start moving beyond the radio announcers being filmed, we'll come up with all sorts of richer ways to interact. But that's only part of the issue. The bigger issue, I think, is um, do societies get or not the, des the news they deserve? Um, there is, you know, there are a lot of conspiracy theorists who think that people in newsrooms around the world or at Fox, et cetera, spend all their time trying to essentially dummy down uh, the news and force Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan on a public that otherwise would be watching Masterpiece Theater <laughs> and Charlie Rose. <clears throat> and I just think that's wrong, you know? <clears throat> there is some element of ratchet down of standards, but I think, you know, if you run a press or any, any uh, media commercially, ultimately you are in the business of delivering as best as you can exactly what the public wants. And, you know, it's always been quite striking to me if you watch CNN International or CNN in the States, and the interesting thing is now on cable you can watch CNN International here and split screen with the US version. You know, the international gets a wider variety of people, of reporters. Um, I think it's great some of the women journalists aren't all blonde, thin, and sit on a couch, um, which is a sort of, I would have thought, natural thing, because not, why should it be that only pretty men or women have a talent for journalism. That would be an unusual skew of the distribution. Um, but there's something in the States about the ability to consume really serious news, which tends to make people's eyes glaze over. And so that's a whole deeper set of issues. Should society actually pay for, right? The BBC has a model like that. A lot of other countries do as well, where there's a belief that to participate in a democracy you need to have enough of an informed electorate um, so that they can effectively vote and you know, elect the right people. And I'd argue that especially around economics, but also around science, there's a real serious gap right now. Um, and I don't think it's crazy at all to think about what would alternative funding mechanisms be to get out the news that we want you to have, whoever this we is, as opposed to just what the market will solve for, because the market will solve, I think, pretty well for exactly what you really want, but that may not be the sort of elucidating uh, news that will help create a, a wonderful, thriving, democratic society. Right in the back first. Oh, no, sorry, in the plaid shirt, yeah. Thanks. My name is Jason Tom. I'm from the United States. Um, I was reading your bio last night, and I was I said to myself, "Wow, this guy's a, a lawyer." And, um, <laughs> I, I, and I'm and, being cured, though. <laughs> in all seriousness, I was wondering if you could talk about some of the challenges or barriers you faced, if any, you know, working your way up through the ranks in an organization like Reuters. Um, you know, there are certainly those that believe you got to start out as a grunt. Um, in a particular industry to work your way up to the top to be a leader. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I've always sort of rebelled at this idea, which is, you know, very popular among um, campus development officers, career development officers, and in HR departments, which is you have this sort of abstract thing called your career or my career, which lives disembodied outside of you and is you spend a lot of time managing this as some weird, uh, uh, I don't know, arrow hopefully pointed in an upward direction, whether or not that suits you, that's what you want to do, et cetera. And you know, I know lots of really good programmers who become frustrated managers because actually what they wanted to be was master scientists and be recognized and actually paid for that. And similarly, journalists and lawyers who've ended up in management positions, but they hated and they'd much rather do what interested them originally in the field. So, you know, there was no particular um, 
secret in, in my life. I'm just naturally curious about a bunch of stuff. And luckily joined a company at the time, uh, Reuters, which um, nobody told me I, what I couldn't do. And so I just kept on roaming around and doing various things until I'd made enough mistakes that I'd learned things. And then sort of Peter principle that kept on going for a long time. So um, the law was not an unuseful start. Um, before that, I had um, done a fair amount of stuff around writing computer code and saw some interesting parallels between, you know, how would I get a program to compile? How would I get a sort of legal contract for, say, a financial instrument to work uh, and not, you know, get caught in some endless loop somewhere? And, you know, brought some of the same thinking to how do you use technology as a platform in a business? But there was no, um, you know, there was no particular magic. I guess the most important thing, which if I had one piece of advice, uh, which I think is generally applicable, is so many people I see in interviews and starting their careers um, have in their mind's eye this image of what the other person wants to hear and it's this sort of anodyne, uh, I am corporate 40-year-old robot. And they forget that actually they're exceptional people. You got into MIT, you thrived here, did really good things. I think the most interesting thing is ultimately, you know, do you know who you are and just be authentic. I mean, does anyone in this room actually talk to your friends like, uh, well, I've evaluated the value proposition in a proactive manner and you know, done this, that, and the other thing. You know, of course not, but suddenly you, you join a company and you think, I gotta sound like a moron just to go, get ahead. <laughs> and I think you should feel free to be whoever you are. You know, woman right in front of you. I'll move around. Hi, thanks so much for coming. Um, my name's Amanda, I'm an MBA student here, and full disclosure, I worked at, the Dow, at Dow Jones this summer, so I have some perspective. But um, I have a question, you talked a little bit about the customer and how important um, you know, providing information and the right content to the customer is, but as companies, you know, the beauty of newspapers and, and traditional websites is that the information company always owned the, in, the customer's information. And now as you move on to devices, companies like Amazon and Apple are struggling with who gets to own the, the data for the customer. And that's so crucial for newspapers and journalism organizations to grow. So I'm just curious what you think will happen in, in the future with customer information and who will ultimately own that. Well, I think the other interesting thing is you see it in Europe already, but um, just the beginnings of it here, um, There'll be some interesting privacy backlashes. You know, we're, we're one really horrible scandal away, not just, ooh, I lost some social security numbers, from, you know, really getting ahead of steam, especially in this administration, toward regulating privacy uh, more actively than, than we see. Um, you know, the battle of who owns the information versus who happens to be the last router hop before delivery to the user um, goes way back. So in our financial services business, you know, stock exchanges make money uh, selling typically through us and others uh, the prices at which, let's say, a stock uh, was sold or the bid and ask prices in the market. And they make a lot of money uh, from that. And these days, that's um, an increasingly larger share of the revenues of an exchange, right? But if you ask yourself the question, well, what is the exchange? Um, isn't, uh, shouldn't that data be owned by the banks executing on that exchange? You know, I put in that sell order. Therefore, if there's information value as to the price and quantity that I'm willing to sell, I should have that value. And then the question is, well, did I act as principal or actually was I aggregating order flow from a bunch of retail accounts? Maybe the 401k participant, the ultimate person who's made an economic invest or disinvest decision owns it. And you know, 
exchanges and other intermediaries would be scared to death if you actually exploded the ownership chain. And before, the practical answer was, well, you couldn't do that, right? I mean, who, could, who can ever trace? Well, now, actually, the compute power is getting to be there. The tagging technology exists. You could imagine um, you know, all sorts of different changes in terms of the economics of who owns the pipe versus who owns the underlying economic activity that flows through that. And the customer data issue, I think, is just the flip side. So everyone's always playing this game of who's zooming who. Um, we don't like the idea of distributing our data uh, through somebody else's um, architecture. We'll do it at the client side, but we'd prefer not to do it through an intermediary because we want to own the customer relationship and we want the ability to improve our product by instrumenting our systems and harvesting the valuable data, whether it's clickstream or cookie or whatever the technology is. Um, I think those are among the most interesting issues and we're just gonna see more and more of it as people twig on to how much information is actually available. Um, you know, the other, I guess, observation I'd have and what's neat about this place is in so many firms, people treat this technology, so many business people treat technology as sort of, oh, honey, I've got the plumber in today, and don't understand that unless you have a sufficient substrate knowledge of what technology can do for you, you can't make strategic or commercial decisions. It's not enough to say, well, I'll just have my CTO meet your CTO and they can do the Vulcan mind meld, you know. Um, you got to actually treat it as uh, know enough so you can extract these sort of principles from it. How about over here? In that wonderful rainbow stripe. <laughs> uh, Mr. Glossos, thank you for being here. Sure. My name is Sergin Bishimov, and I'm part of a group of students behind the MIT Entrepreneurship Review, which is an analog of the Yale Law Journal, but for <laughs> MIT. And um, I want to push you further on the question about challenges faced by Thomson Reuters. Mm -hmm. I agree that the output device is not really a big challenge. You find, you'll find a way to get anywhere you like. But I think the real challenge is the proliferation of content producers, ranging from bloggers, super tweeters, to high quality niche producers like Politico or the MIT Entrepreneurship Review. <laughs> S seriously. Uh -huh. That's good. And my question is, what are your thoughts on dealing with that really, really important challenge? Yeah, it's a fascinating issue because, you know, in the old days, all of the sort of law and also, um, I don't know, thinking around how do you create uh, uh, an environment where lots, a plurality of views can be, uh, uh, expressed and consumed was all around, you know, a, a rich person or a rich company owned the printing uh, uh, press or in television, you know, a one-way pipe out to an audience. And there was this initial moment of jubilation when, you know, suddenly you realize it's a two-way pipe and the Berlin Wall had fallen and everyone can be a publisher. And that's really neat, except you get you sort of fall back into this problem, which is there's then so much information out there and so many potential sources, um, you can't find it again. You can't find it not because it's scarce and there's no way of, of getting at it. You can't get it because um, you need a lighthouse. You need uh, curation. You need an editor. You need a search engine to find it. So you've already solved a little bit of that problem because it's the MIT journal, right? Um, brands become real important again because they're a signaling device of, I'm, you know, I'm assuming that um, MIT would yank the brand and close down the publication if you printed a lot of hate speech in it. So I, I know that in, in even before I decide to click through, Oh, it's the MIT entrepreneur. Well, that's interesting. That, that tells me a couple of things I think I know about it. The quality of the 
individuals, um, the education they're receiving that are writing it, it's probably worth an interesting read. And similarly, I think you see that um, in a lot of other, whether it's media or across the board, um, strong brands still end up being a signaling device and become more important again. Um, what I think is real interesting is how do brands reach out and not just publish only their own things, how do they also act um, as cooperatively with citizen journalists, uh, how do they aggregate, um, how do they tag their own data in a way that allows you to then uh, go and make a combination of information that includes some stuff from the primary uh, vendor, if you will, but a lot of other links to information that they can't possibly own everything behind the walled uh, garden. So all sorts of interesting issues. You should write about it and I'll read it. You, <laughs> I'll go right to your neighbor and then back around there. Uh, hi, um, Gothamire, first year. Um, I was uh, struck by when you mentioned um, like how uh, Thomson Reuters was able to capitalize on the internet early on, really before a lot of other companies recognized it and um, therefore was able to sort of jump ahead of a lot of competitors and so on. Um, can you talk a little more about sort of how you were able to recognize that it was a transformative uh, technology for your industry and for others and then also tips on maybe how to recognize um, forthcoming transformative technologies? Oh, uh, well, that's the hard one, right? Because everyone's a genius in retrospect, and you never, you don't invite the people who've screwed up, right? So that means you get this very self selective, let me tell you how, how smart we were in getting it right. All the other, it's like the mutual funds that you never see, the ones that have the lousy track record, you, you only have the fidelity fund that's done the best. Um, and I can tell you the story uh, briefly at Reuters, which was one of experimentation and doing a lot of stupid things. And uh, we did, the following story is either bright or stupid, right? So uh, for a uh, million dollars investment, I went to the Reuters board in 1980, what was it, 1994, and uh, got permission to invest a million dollars in Yahoo to get two and a half percent of the company and cement an early content relationship with them. Uh, so on the one hand, you know, that would have been nice, set for life, big capital gain return. On the other hand, it was really stupid uh, because there's no, why did Yahoo, even if it was maybe only for a moment in time, uh, managed to be the information source on the web. Why didn't Reuters become that? That would have been a much more interesting business, right? But we learned a lot from it. We learned by working with them. Um, we, had, we made all the other stupid mistakes. We had a division called Reuters New Media, and it sold to websites, and Reuters Old Media sold to like the globe and to broadcasters, et cetera, until the day it became obvious that's a ridiculous, are you going to segment your offering by output device? That doesn't make a lot of sense. And these newspapers are starting to have websites of their own, so we brought them back together. So I think the answer was really um, we made a lot of mistakes. We tried to make smaller mistakes and learn from them. Um, and we iterated a lot, and we were pretty um, we were pretty open with our content. Um, so for example, um, I don't know how, I, I play a lot with different technologies, different sites and things. So I had stumbled on um, Second Life uh, reasonably early on and you know, thought it was a really interesting, uh, this idea of virtual worlds. I was interested in it ultimately as a graphics environment in which we could conceivably convey more 3D information in the financial markets by creating immersive uh, experiences. But actually what ended up happening, because other folks with other good ideas in the company, we put a Reuters journalist in Second Life reporting both about news in the real world into Second Life and about 
the real estate and other transactions that were going on with Linden dollars in Second Life. And we had our own news island, we had a little device uh, which was, could be carried around in, in, for free inside the environment and, and bring you this news feed in effect. And we learn a lot of really interesting stuff from it. So I guess to me the, the most important thing is um, let some people experiment and let them do it with your real weapons and not just sort of hermetically sealed away in some, some different part of the business. Um, oh, okay, you choose, because I can't. It's a nice day. You mean people are really going to class? <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm Violeta. I'm visiting scholar here uh, from Portugal, and my area is entrepreneurship and innovation. And I'm very much intrigued by the strategy that of your technological strategy uh, of your company that you present and this light positioning on the technology. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit more. How do you manage to align organizational flexibility or lightness uh, that could uh, follow this technological strategy? Yeah, that's Thank really you. hard because um, you know people live in particular geographies and don't just sort of float amorphous in a cloud. Um, and also people are very different by temperament. You know, I, I tolerate very high levels of ambiguity and think that's exhilarating and interesting and uh, creative. And unfortunately, a whole lot of people who, who get a lot more done than I do like to live in a much more structured and directed world. And the only answer I've ever found is don't make everyone like you because you're guaranteed to get you know, uh, nothing but more copies of yourself. And surround yourself with people with many different sorts of skill sets and listen to them. And the really hard organizational thing, I think, is how do you get the balance right? And it's probably been the most interesting cultural thing bringing the Thompson and Reuters organizations together. Um, how do you have um, enough discourse, right? So people listen, share, collaborate. Uh, uh, how does the product person listen to the person running the India front line who says, forget about this price point and forget about your technology. It doesn't work here. Um, but how do you balance that with actually getting anything done? Because a lot of companies, and Reuters had this tendency, uh, would have such wonderful conversations that they'd never actually get onto the doing bit, right? And so balancing those two sides is really, really tough. And there's no magic organization or formula, I think. You just have to, it takes active transport to get it done. Well, thank you all. It was fun. Thank you, Tom. Uh, all I can say is that uh, if you ever want to get bored with CEO job and want to be a technology strategy professor, <laughs> you know, we will welcome you. Uh, but in the meanwhile, as a token of you know, appreciation, I appreciate a small it. gift. So, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.